we're in a series called Churchy Words, and what we've said about this series is that Jesus followers um, have kind of this insider language, this Christian speak that we tend to use, and we said that there are kind of two different levels of this, and if you grew up in church, you've heard a lot of these things. If you did not, then you may scratch your head and think, um, what's going on? What does that language even mean? And I said last week, there's kind of this level of language of words that we use that I'm not sure where they come from, uh, but they're just kind of a part of our vernacular. Maybe certain churches use these type of words that may not even be um, found in the Bible. I was, I've been jotting a few of those down um, throughout the, the week uh, that just kind of come to my mind. Uh, one of the phrases that kind of falls into that category is the phrase backsliding. Anybody ever heard that? It's not in the Bible anywhere, but we use that. Um, I know some people think maybe when they hear that, if they're not a church person, they may think that's the old moonwalk, right? I'm back sliding. You impressed with that? You impressed with those dancing skills? Um, backsliding. You may backslide because someone caused you to stumble. That's, what, that's actually in the text somewhere, uh, but that's a phrase that we use. That doesn't mean to trip someone. Um, that means that someone spiritually caused you to stumble. When I grew up in youth groups, um, phrases that were used is that someone is on fire for God. You ever heard that? On fire? There's a song written about that that had to do with a house. The house is on fire. Uh, this is a different kind of on fire. Another phrase is similar to the phrase on fire is someone is sold out for Jesus. Have you heard that? Sold out uh, for Jesus. That means something different to people that are trying to go to the concert of one of their favorite artists and hear that the concert is sold out. Different meaning, okay? Some of you only know that meaning of sold out. The tickets were sold out. Um, another one, this is, this is a spiritual phrase that we use that really means the service went too long. This is a phrase that people will say to me that really means the service went too long. The spirit was moving. I know what you really mean. <laughs> Service went a little longer than it should. The Spirit was moving. So there's those type of words that we use at church, and we kind of scratch our heads and think, where did that come from? And I'm sure it has some history. But that's not what this series is about. This series is about words that help define our beliefs. I told you last week that this series is really kind of just an excuse for me to teach you some uh, basic theology. I love to teach and um, this is one of those series that is a biblically driven series that allows us to talk about uh, some of our doctrinal and biblical beliefs. And these words that we're talking about are essential to our faith. They help define our faith. Last week, we talked about God words. If you were not here last week, I would encourage you to listen to the message. It reminds us of the bigness of God. Uh, we used 37 scriptures last week. Breathe a sigh of relief. Today, we're only using 32. Um, I know some of you got a hand cramp from trying to keep up. Some of you just got exasperated like halfway through. You're like, I'm done. I saw pins flying. Like, I'm not trying to keep up. Just email it to me or whatever. So don't feel like you need to jot everything down. I can send it to you if you need all of these references. But today we are talking about Bible words. These are words that we use about the Bible, not words necessarily that come from the Bible, but words that we use about the Bible. The Bible, the B-I-B-L-E. Remember that little Sunday school song? Sing it with me. The B-I-B-L-E. Yes, that's the book for me. I stand alone on the Word of God, the B-I-B-L-E. Some of you are good. You remember that. Do you know verse 2? The B-I-B-L-E. I'll take you home with me. I'll read and pray and then obey the B-I-B-L-E. You don't know that one? I used to know one about the KJV that went with it, but that was, again, in the circles I grew up in. <laughs> so let me set the stage with this important word about the Bible. The very first one is the word revelation, okay? Now, when I use the word revelation here, I'm not talking about the last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation, which, by the way, when you're talking to people about the Bible and you're talking about the book of Revelation, no S on it, okay? Just revelation, 
not revelations. It was just one big revelation given to John, okay? So you look at your Bible. There's no S on the end. Uh, The last book of the Bible is the big revelation at the end. But we're not talking about the book of Revelation. I almost said revelations because it's so natural. What we're talking about is the idea of revelation is the act by which God reveals. God makes himself known. He makes known what was otherwise unknowable. Okay, so the word, even the original Greek word, means to uncover something, to remove a veil, to disclose something that was unknown before. So I started thinking this week, just kind of break the ice, what are some things that you may or may not know uh, that I'll reveal to you this morning? Interesting facts, okay? This doesn't have anything to do with the Bible. We'll get back to that in a second. Um, Here's some interesting facts of things you are going to leave here. There's no way all of you know all ten of these. So some of you, we're going to all leave here with some new knowledge, okay? The painting, the Mona Lisa, she has no eyebrows. Bam, revelation. The strongest muscle in the human body is the tongue. Probably because of all the exercise it gets. Strongest muscle in the body, the tongue. Women blink nearly twice as much as men. How many of you knew this? No one? See? Revelation. You cannot kill yourself by holding your breath. It is impossible to lick your elbow. Go ahead, go ahead, you're dying to do it. I know, some of you are like... <laughs> There's only one food that does not spoil. Does anyone know what it is? Honey. Honey. A snail can sleep for three years. So can my wife. <laughs> she wishes she had three years to sleep sometimes. An elephant is the only animal that cannot jump. For obvious reasons. I like this one. When the moon is directly overhead, you weigh slightly less. So if you're like on the scale trying to lose weight since the new year, weigh when the moon is directly overhead. And then here's the last revelation I'll give you today. The product Coca-Cola was originally green. Revelation. How many of you learned something in that? Okay, all of us. Go ahead and put your hand up. You don't be embarrassed. To unveil, to uncover something, to reveal something. We talk about revelation when it comes to God and His Word. We are talking about God revealing Himself so that we can know Him and we can have fellowship with Him. The story of the Bible is God revealing Himself. God coming down to us, which we believe in and of itself is an act of grace. And so when we start talking about this idea of revelation, uh, most biblical scholars, most theologians talk about two types of revelation. First, there is general revelation, that God reveals himself in a general way to all people at all times in all places. The ways that God does this is often through nature. You can look at nature itself and see that there's a creator God. There's a lot of arguments for the existence of God that kind of center around the idea that the complexity of the world, the complexity of the human body, the complexity of the solar system all point to the idea that there's a creator. There's an intelligent designer behind that. And so nature itself testifies that there is a God. And we'll look at the verses that have to do with this in a moment. Um, History itself testifies that there is a God, reveals God. God has revealed himself throughout history. Our experiences reveal that there is a God. You can experience things in life, the birth of a child, other things that happen in your life to point to the idea that God has revealed himself. And then Paul even says, In Romans 1, that our consciences tell us that there is a God, that God has revealed himself through our conscience. Now, um, Genesis 1-1 assumes that there is a God, right? In the beginning, God created the heaven and earth. The Bible doesn't open up by trying to prove the existence of God. It's not uh, an apologetic handbook that's trying to prove God to an atheist. It assumes that there is a God who has revealed himself. So here's some verses that have to do with general revelation of God. Psalm 19. The heavens declare the glory of God. The sky above proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech. Night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words whose voice is not heard. So the psalmist says that the heavens themselves point to 
God, that God has revealed himself. Then perhaps the most famous words about this um, are from Paul in Romans chapter 1. Uh, The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known, there's that idea of revelation, what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly perceived even since the creation of the world and the things that he made so that we are without excuse. Paul says that God has revealed himself, his power, his nature have been clearly revealed. And then in chapter 2 he picks up on it. When Gen- for when Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do what the law requires, they are a law to themselves even though they do not have the law. They show that the work of the law is written where? On their hearts, while their conscience also bears witness. And their conflicting thoughts accuse or even excuse them. So, again, in in Romans 1, Paul says that God has revealed himself in nature, in our conscience, in history, in time, God has revealed himself. So there's general revelation. God's revealed himself to all people of all times. We also believe there's a second type of revelation that's very specific. It is special revelation, or some will call it particular revelation. That means that God has revealed himself in a particular way to a particular people at a particular time and place. He's been very specific. And this falls into kind of two ideas. Uh, First is the idea that God has revealed himself in what we call salvation history. That God has revealed himself throughout time, particular places, particular people, that all climaxed in one revelation of a person, which was who? It was Jesus, right? That God revealed himself ultimately in the person, Jesus Christ, that he was the living revelation of God. Uh, check out these verses, uh, John chapter 1. We've studied that in our belief project early on. Um, and the word became flesh and lived among us, dwelled among us. We've seen his glory, glory of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth, Uh, Look at Hebrews 1. This is an important text when it comes to the idea of revelation. Long ago, at many times, in many ways, God spoke to our our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom he also created the world. And then Galatians 4.4. When the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of woman, born under The law. And so Jesus is the supreme revelation of God. God revealed himself in a person in salvation history, in the person Jesus Christ. And I would say also that in salvation history, that God reveals himself as we experience the revelation of God in salvation. If you've experienced salvation by grace uh, through faith, you've experienced the revelation of God, that God saves us. He reveals himself to us and saves us. So there's the idea of salvation history, this special particular revelation. And then secondly, There's the idea of the scriptures, that God has revealed himself in a book, not just in a person, but in a book. This is the written revelation of God. Living revelation is Jesus. The written kind of propositional revelation of God is his word. And so God reveals himself generally through all of creation, all of time, all people, all places. God reveals himself specifically in Jesus Christ, in the word that there is specific, special revelation of God revealing himself. Now, what does this have to do with our everyday life? What is the relevance of this? So this reminds us that God has revealed himself so that we might know him, so that we might experience him. So what that means for us when it comes to the idea of revelation is that we need to pay attention, look around, get the word of God in you, ingest the truth of Scripture. God can be known. He has revealed himself. He has revealed himself throughout all of creation. He has revealed himself specifically through the Son of God, through Jesus Christ. He has revealed himself specifically through the Word of God, so God can be known. People will say, where is God? Why didn't God show up? How can I know there's a God? And my response is like, look around you. God is everywhere. He has revealed himself in so many ways and so many times and so many places. He continues to reveal himself through his word. It is right in front of us. So the idea of revelation. Now, another important word when it comes to this idea of special revelation that God's revealed himself through the word of God is the word canon, okay? And I'm not talking about 
a weapon, like you load up the big cannonball and boom, you know, shoots the, the giant ball out or a man out if you're in a circus. Not talking about that type of cannon. This is a one-end cannon, not the weapon. The word cannon means kind of a rule, a rod, a standard for measurement. If I have a yardstick, that is, what, 36 inches, three, one yard, yardstick, almost at three yards. How intelligent am I? It's called a yardstick, Devin. One yard, three feet, right? That's a yardstick to measure something. So you ever thought, like, why do we have the 66 that we have? The 66 books that are in there. Why do we have those? That's the word canon. Now, this is important. God determines the canon. We, humans, discovered it. Humans recognized it through early church. But God determined the canon. God inspired, we'll talk about that in a moment, Scripture. God determines the canon. We recognize it. Now, they had criteria in the early church to which ones we include, which ones do we leave out. How did they recognize the ones they believed that God had inspired? There was things like, was it written by a prophet? Was it written by an apostle, an associate of apostle? Was it confirmed by God? Does it tell the truth about God? Is it consistent with the other books that we have as part of the canon? Was it accepted by the people of God? These are all criteria that the early church used to help determine or help discover um, the canon of God. But here's what's important. We believe that we have what God intended for us to have, that this is what God wanted us to have. Between these two leather pages, well, I guess maybe not the maps if I have maps in here, but you know what I'm saying. From Genesis 1, 1 through the end of Revelation, we have what we believe God intended for us to have. Here's why that's important. Here's the next word, the word inspiration. We believe that the word of God, that God divinely guided the human authors of Scripture so that what they wrote were the very words of God. That's inspiration. We believe as the authors of the Bible penned the Scriptures, that God divinely enabled, God divinely guided the human author so that they wrote exactly what God wanted them to write. Now, sometimes when you see this word inspiration, you'll see a couple of words that go with it. Um, and by the way, this idea of inspiration, that means that the Word of God, we believe the Bible is unique to any other book in all of human history. We believe there's one inspired book. Now, I'm not saying that it's an inspiring book. Sometimes that gets confusing. I'm saying more than it's just inspiring. I'm saying it is breathed out by God. It is inspired by God. So some words that sometimes go with this idea of of inspiration, you'll sometimes hear the word verbal plenary. Verbal means it extends to even the very choice of words, that every word in the Scripture was given to us by God. And then the idea of plenary means it's the Latin word for full, It means it extends to every part. Every subject matter that the Bible addresses is the the truth of God. That means it's authoritative. What that means is where the Bible speaks, it speaks with authority. That it is verbally inspired down to the very choice of words to every part of Scripture. It is inspired by God. There's a phrase called concursive that means... It is both a divine book and a human book at the same time. So what that means is like when you kind of read the Bible, you'll, you'll read particularly kind of the original languages the Bible is written in, um, different authors had different styles. Like Paul wrote in a way that was very different than like Peter wrote. You know why? Because Peter was a fisherman. His language is very um, crass at times, is his, um, written in the, the Greek um, the, the, sometimes there's like not verb and subject agreement in Peter's writings. You know why? Because he's a fisherman. Paul was a scholar. Paul's an Old Testament trained genius, basically. So the way he wrote mirrors his upbringing. So the human authors use their personalities. They use their own writing styles. But within that, it was a completely divine book. Completely human. Completely divine. Sounds like Jesus, right? The God-man. Completely human. Completely divine. God. And so the verbal plenary inspiration of Scripture. So because the Bible's inspired by God, here's what that means. Two more Bible words I'm going to throw at you. That means we believe the Bible is inerrant. The word inerrant means free from any error. 
Now, when I say that, when I say the Bible is inerrant, I want you to understand I'm talking about the original manuscripts that God wrote. What you hold in your hand is a, tra- a translation of some sort that's been translated from a family of original texts all the way down to where we're sitting here in 2020 holding in our hands some type of translation of the Bible. So we believe that inerrancy applies to what was originally written um, by the original authors, that God inspired the original authors of Scripture, and so it's free from any error. The second word that you often hear is the idea of it's infallible. What that means is that the Bible will always lead you to the truth. It's incapable of of misleading you. Because it's inspired by God, breathed out by God, it is the inspired, right, inerrant, infallible word of God. Look at these verses. This is Jesus talking in Matthew 5. Do not think that I've come to abolish the law of prophets. I've not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota or a dot, this is the smallest little symbols in the Hebrew language, not an iota or a dot, that's almost like a comma or a period in our English, not an iota nor a dot will pass from the law until it's all accomplished. So Jesus is saying, down to the very markings of the text, it is the Word of God. Look what Peter said. No prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So there's that idea of inspiration. Human authors carried along by the Holy Spirit. Uh, John 10, 35, Jesus said, Scripture cannot be broken. It cannot be broken. And then Paul in 2 Timothy 3, and this is one of the most important verses when it comes to this idea of the Bible being inspired, all Scripture is breathed out by God. All Scripture breathed out by God profitable for teaching, reproof, correction, training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. The translation there literally means the breath of God. If you are holding a Bible this morning, wrap your mind around this, you are holding in your hands the very breath of God on a page. All Scripture is God breathed. Do you know that alone helps me know that we should take this seriously? Do you know that there are literally hundreds of people groups around the world right now that have no version of God's Word in their language? They do not even possess a copy of the Word of God in their language. I don't even know how many Bibles I have on the shelves and collecting dust. The type of access I have to God's Word is unbelievable. You're holding, most of you are holding in your hands a phone that makes God's Word accessible to you in a moment's time. And there are people groups around the world that will live and die and never hold or hear even a simple verse from the Word of God. And we hold the breath of God on a page in our hands or sitting on our shelf or collecting dust. The very inspired word of God. Not something to be taken lightly, is it? So, because the Bible's inspired, inerrant, infallible, let me mention this other word. Because inspired, inerrant, infallible, we believe it is sufficient. The word of God is sufficient. God has given us everything we need to know about the way of salvation and how to live in obedience to God. We know what pleases Him because He's given it to us in a book. Go back to 2 Timothy that I I just read. Uh, Paul said to Timothy, this scripture is God-breathed and is profitable for teaching, reproof, correction, training in righteousness that the person of God, the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Paul is saying to his young protege, Timothy, the kind of up-and-coming preacher boy that's, that's going to be pastoring one of the churches that Paul planted, he's saying to Timothy that the Word of God is enough for you, that you can be thoroughly equipped. It is everything you need. It's everything you need to be wholly and fully equipped to do ministry. Now, this is important. 
The Bible is not an encyclopedia of knowledge where it speaks, it speaks authoritatively, it speaks truthfully, it's, it speaks accurately. But the Bible's not a textbook, right? So what that means is if you're going to be a scientist, then you read science, you study nature. If you're going to be a person that learns economics, then you study business. You're not going to find economic principles in the Word of God. If you're going to be an athlete, you practice and you learn the rules of the game. If you're going to be a pilot, you learn how to fly a plane. You don't go searching in here for, well, what do I do with this like knob that's up in front of me? Like that's, you don't find that in here. It's not an encyclopedia of knowledge. It's the Bible you've heard me say before. The Bible is not a life manual. The Bible is God's story of his pursuit and redemption of rebels. It provides everything that we need to know about God and to live out our faith. It is sufficient for you in living out your faith. It is sufficient for you in knowing God. It is everything that you need to know who God is and to live out in obedience to him. Let me remind you of this. So important to say this in our day and time. The sufficiency of Scripture also reminds us that what God has provided is enough. It's enough. You don't need an appendix. What that means is that we should be very slow to use language that God is speaking beyond what He's already stated in the Bible. Be hesitant to embrace, this is important, be hesitant to embrace the teaching of people who are constantly using God told me language and are not preaching straight from the Bible. For some reason, those two things seem to go together to me. When I listen to a lot of pe- preachers speak, and a lot of people stand on the stage and what they say they're doing is preaching and they'll do a lot of God told me this or God revealed to me this, but they're not even like preaching the Bible. Like, why do those two things seem to go together so much? Like, so be hesitant, be hesitant to ingest a lot of preaching and teaching of people that are constantly talking about God told me this or God told me that, but they're not just opening up the Bible and preaching it. Here's what I say to you. Because one, I think when you do that, it kind of creates this division among people. Like, I know that when I'm in those situations, I've sat in seats and thought, well, why doesn't God speak to me like that? Any ever been on that page with me? Why has God not told me those things? Like that person must be a special person if God's telling them all that, right? And so there's a lot of space for God to speak. I just wrote about it this week in um, a blog. So if you're interested in what I have to say about the subject, you can go to my blog. It's just my name.com. Um, not my name.com, DevinHudson.com, but you know what I mean? <laughs> I just wrote about it this week about God speaking. So here's what you've heard me say, and I'll say it again. Do you want to hear God speak? Pick up your Bible and read it. He's speaking on every page. You want to hear God speak out loud? Pick up your Bible and read it out loud. God is speaking on every page. Now, I'm not the type of person that believes that at the end of the first century when the church was stopped that, or started that everything stopped. I believe that God continues to speak in different ways and reveals himself in different ways. So again, you can go read my thoughts. There's plenty of it out there about this. What I, but I'm just, what I'm warning you about is ingesting a lot of information from people who are constantly saying God told me this and didn't tell you that, and then they're not just preaching from the Bible. Here's the relevance of what I'm saying. The Bible is God's word to us. It is the breath of God on a page. The Hebrew writer says it is living. It is active. It is life-giving. It is transformative. So what that means is, the way we say it here at City Church, get the Bible in you. Get it in you. So here we go. I'm going to rattle off a bunch of verses. I want you to hear what the Scriptures have to say about themselves. Psalm, this first set of verses from the book of Psalm. Psalm 12, 6. The words of the Lord are, what's that word? Pure words. Undefiled. Like silver refined in a furnace on the ground, purified seven times. 19.7. The law of the Lord is, what's that word? Perfect. Reviving, I like that phrase, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is, what's that word? 
sure. Making wise the simple. 33.4. For the word of the Lord is what? Upright. All his work is done in faithfulness. 119.9. How can a young man keep his way pure? By what? By guarding it according to your word. 119.11. I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. 89 of 119. Forever, O Lord, your word is firmly fixed in the heavens. 105 that we uh, uh, um, quoted in our call to worship. Your word is a lamp to my feet, a light to my path. This is the idea of direction. This is the idea of clarity. Get the Bible in you. It gives you clarity. It gives you direction. 119, 130. The unfolding of your words give light. It imparts understanding to the simple. And then verse 160 of 119. The sum of your word is truth. Every one of your righteous rules endures forever. Just what we get from the book of Psalms tells us how much direction and clarity and wisdom there is in the Word of God. Get it in you. I mean, how many of us are looking for direction and clarity and truth and surety and something to stand upon and some sure foundation? And the psalmist says in his songbook again and again and again, God's Word is all of those things. Get the Bible in you. That's just from the book of Psalms. Look what Joshua says. This book of the law, by the way, the book of the law that he was talking about was basically the first five books of the Bible. You know how much we have? We have 66 books. Joshua just speaking about just the book of the law, just the Genesis through Deuteronomy. The book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night. And then look what Joshua says, so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, then you will have good success. Joshua says when you meditate on the word of God, it will make your way prosperous, you will have good success. It's not talking about what's in your bank account here. It's talking about direction. It's talking about taking right steps in your life as you ingest the word of God. Isaiah This is depth in this verse. Isaiah 40, verse 8. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of God will stand forever. Isaiah 55, 11. So shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty. Some translations say it shall not come back void. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. God says to Isaiah the prophet, when you get the Bible in you, it will not come back void. It accomplishes God's purpose in your life. Here's what Jesus says in Matthew 24. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. Eternal. John 17, verse 7. Now they know that everything you have given me is from you. The words of God, the words of Jesus, straight from the Father. Uh, Paul, Romans 10, 17. Faith comes by hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. Romans 15, 4. Whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction, that through endurance and through the encouragement of the Scriptures, we might have hope. 1 Thessalonians 2, 13. We also thank God constantly for this, that when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the word of men, but as what it really is, the word of God, which is at work in you over and over and over again. Get the Bible in you. Hebrews 4.12, I mentioned it earlier. The word of God is living and active. It is sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to division of soul and spirit, joints and marrow, discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. James 1.21, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. Then one more, 1 Peter 2.2, like newborn infants long for pure spiritual milk that by it you may grow up into salvation. This is nothing but a scratch of the surface of what the Bible says to get the Bible in you. And what I'm saying to you through all of these verses is that if you will get the Bible in you, it will transform your life. Get it in you. 
All right, one more little set of words here, and we'll wrap this up. This is a kind of funny-sounding word, the word hermeneutics. Some of you have an Uncle Herman. This is not Uncle Herman, but this is his cousin hermeneutics, the study of Herman, I guess. No, this is the art of how we interpret the Bible, how we interpret the Bible. You see, I believe that the Bible is not just about reading, it's about studying. Matter of fact, the verses we just read imply that as we hunger after God's Word, that there's spiritual growth that happens. There's maturity that happens in Christian living. And so what that means is when you have the Word of God, you have to be intentional with it. You have to be intentional to learn it, to study it, to read it, be intentional. What I do not endorse is just the old point or flip and point method. We've heard that, right? I needed a word from God, and I put my Bible in front of the fan, and I just, bam! That's what God had to say to me. I heard, I heard that this happen one time. Of a pastor ran into a guy that attended his church on occasion uh, that was in his community, and he was talking to the guy, and the guy was talking about how he was about to lose everything, and he's like, I've invested in all the wrong things, and I've, I've lost all my money, and my wife is ready to leave, and my, my kids are frustrated with me. I'm about to lose my house, and I don't know what to do. And the pastor said, look, here's an idea. Take your Bible, go to the beach, sit in a beach chair in front of the ocean, open your Bible, allow the wind um, to, to, ch- to turn the pages of your Bible, and then you just put your finger down and you stop reading. So he gives that guy that advice, and uh, he sees the guy three months later. The guy's decked out in a designer suit, and he has on a nice watch, and he's just moved in a new house, and he's driving a nice car. And the pastor was like, man, what, what happened? He was like, well, I followed your advice. I, I went to the beach, and I sat down in the chair, and I allowed the, 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 the wind to, to blow the Bible, and I just put my finger down, and it changed everything in my life from that moment forward. And the pastor was like, man, that is so crazy and unique. Like, where did you land? Where did you put your finger down? He was like, pastor, my eyes went to the page, and what I saw was chapter 11. Some of you get that and know what chapter 11 is. Some of you don't. That's the good thing about my joke. Just, some of you get it, some of you don't. Some of you will get it after lunch. You'll wake up from your nap. Chapter 11, ah, God revealed himself. Be intentional. Be intentional with the word of God. There are three Simple ways to learn to study your Bible. Now, let me preface this with one. The the easiest thing I know how to tell you to do is get a good study Bible. There are so many resources out there. Just get you a good study Bible. We can make recommendations for that. Just get you a good study Bible that helps you do these things I'm going to mention very quickly. How do I get the Bible in me? Learn to study the Bible. Some very simple things. These are churchy words that we use. Observation. What do I see? Be a detective when it comes to the text. Observe the text. What do I see? I just read and then I observe. What do I see in the text? Second word, interpretation. What does it mean? Particularly, what does it mean in context? Why did Peter write this? To who was he writing? There's so many tools out there that can give you the the proper context and why the verse was written and to whom it was written. Use the tools. Use other people. Let me give you like a a very uh, sobering thought. Like if you are reading the Bible and you come up with an interpretation that the church has not caught wind of for 2,000 years, it's probably not the right interpretation. So it's a good thing that we're in 2020 because a lot of people have had a lot to say about the text in the last 2,000 years. So it's awesome for us to be able to have the tools and the resources to be able to say, what does this mean? So look at the text, uh, interpret the text, and then apply the text. How does it apply to my life? When I get to know this text and relate it to my life and meditate upon it and practice it, that is the, that is the application of the text. Observe it. Be a detective with the Bible. Interpret the Bible. What does it mean? Get the resource. And again, a great study Bible can help you do that to understand what it means. And then apply it. How does this apply to my life? And then I'm going to end with just this one last word. And that is the word illumination. This is a biblical concept. It is the process by which the Holy Spirit enables us to understand the truth of God's Word. One of our last Belief Project sermons before we took the break was from John 16, and this is what Jesus said in John 16. When the Spirit of truth comes, He will what? Guide you into all the truth. For He will not speak on His own authority, but whatever He hears, He will speak, and He will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, for He will take what is mine and declare it 
to you. Uh, Jesus promised that when the Holy Spirit comes, that he will dwell inside of us and that he will guide us to the truth. God, the Holy Spirit, if you're a follower of Jesus, God, the Holy Spirit lives inside of you and he will guide you to the truth. Ask him. He will guide you to the truth. This illumination that God opens our eyes to the truth of God's word. Here's my final thoughts. First and foremost, we are going to preach the Bible at City Church. We're going to preach the Bible. We're going to open up the Bible and we're going to preach it. We're going to follow Paul's advice to his young protege, Timothy. And Paul said to Timothy, go preach the word. Preach the word. We're going to preach the Bible. Paul also said to Timothy, preach Christ crucified. That's what we're going to do. We're going to preach the Bible. We're going to preach the gospel. When you come into these walls on a Sunday morning, I want you to know up front, you're not here for a self-help seminar. You're not here for a motivational speech to necessarily make you feel better so you can make it through another week. I'm going to open up the Bible and yell at you a lot because you need God's truth in you, just like I do. We need God's truth in us. There's plenty out there if you want to be motivated and inspired by some type of feel good about yourself motivational speeches. There's plenty of out, out there to go listen to. But when you come in here, we're going to follow Paul's advice. We're going to open up the Bible and we're going to preach the Bible. We're going to preach Jesus crucified. We're going to preach the gospel because I believe that is what will transform your life from the inside out. If I make you feel good about yourself on the outside, I haven't accomplished anything. But if I will preach the Bible to you over time, Sunday after Sunday after Sunday, I believe God will do his work in you and will transform you from the inside out. And guess what? That'll encourage you. That'll inspire you. That'll motivate you, but at the end of the day, I want you to get the Bible in you. Now, here's why that's important. Oh, yeah. <laughs> like, I really need a self-help seminar right now. Um, now, here, here's, what I want, here's how I want to preface that, because it's easy for me to stand up here and yell about that, but I want you to have the mindset of the Brians. You know what the Brians were? Acts 17. Paul's preaching. It's Paul for crying out loud, preaching. Paul's preaching. Like, Paul. All right? It's not like Devin. It's not like whoever else you got on your podcast. It's Paul preaching. And here's how the, the Berean Christians responded to Paul. Now, these Jews were more noble than those in Thessalonica. They received the word with all eagerness examining the scriptures daily to see if the things were so. Here's what happened. Paul stood up and yelled at them and preached the Bible to them. And, the, and then the Bereans was like, man, that's good. I'm receiving it with eagerness. Now, I'm going to go get my Bible and make sure it's true. Do I ever say, do I ever say that, by the way? <laughs> do I ever say, if what I said goes against the book, then you go with what? You go with the book. So I want you to come and listen with eagerness because I'm going to preach the Bible to you. I want you to come and listen with eagerness. But I want you to say, man, I really believe what Devin has to say because he preaches the Bible, he preaches the truth. But at the end of the day, if you open this up and I disagree with it, you go with this. Be a Berean. Be a Berean. When you listen to podcasts, be a Berean. When you hear the latest preacher, be a Berean. When you, watch, when you watch religious TV, if you watch religious TV, you better for sure be a Berean. When you go in Books A Million and look at all the top-selling Christian books, you better be a Berean. And if you're going to be a Berean, I just want to tell you up front, you better leave most of them on the shelf. Some of those books I've taken out of the Christian living section and put them in the fiction section. <laughs> Be a Berean. What about this? Don't make Bible reading and study complicated. Keep it simple. Keep it simple. So many people ask me about this subject, and here's what I say. 
Start with where you are in life. Start with where you are in life. If that means five minutes for you, let it be five minutes. Open up your Bible and read it for five minutes. Read a gospel. Devin, where do I start? Go to the gospels. Read Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Read a gospel. Read the story of Jesus. Here, here's a good one. Just read one proverb a day. Do you know there's 31 proverbs? Almost every month has either 30 or 31 days except for the one we're in now. So on, guess what? On February, whatever day it is, the 9th, you can read Proverbs chapter 9. Simple steps to start where you're at in life. But the only thing I want to say to you is start somewhere. Start somewhere. If you have a smartphone, there are apps that will send a scripture to you every morning. And the ones they choose are usually pretty simple, straightforward, and easy to read. And some of them come with a devotional with them. Start somewhere. Keep it simple. I'm not telling you sit down, crack open your Bible at Genesis 1, and don't stop till you get to Revelation. Because I can tell you about Leviticus, you're going to bog down and be like, I'm done with this. Keep it simple. How about this? Use the tools available to you. We have more resources available to us for this subject than any time in human history. We have more resources available at our fingertips than any time in human history. Like, I'm a book person. I own a lot of books. I like to read books. My dad is like a huge book person and owns thousands and thousands and thousands of books. But I can tell you, like, modern day preaching, studying, all those things, I have more access to stuff in my fingertips than I have in my library. Isn't that crazy? Like sitting in front of my laptop, I have more exposure to knowledge and truth about God's Word than the hundreds of volumes that I have sitting in my library. The tools are available to you. Use them. Technology is used in so many negative ways to fill your heart, mind, and eyes with so many negative things. How about if we use technology to get the Bible in us? Listen to it. Listen to it read, read to you. There's apps that someone will read the Bible to you while you're driving to work. Listen to the Bible read to you. Listen to it taught. Listen to it explained. Use whatever tools are available to you that work for you to get the Bible in you. And here's the last one, and I'm done. Trust God to do his work. Trust God to do his work in you. Ask God, open my heart and mind to the truth of God's word. Read God's word. Observe, interpret, apply, and guess what? Repeat. Repeat. Ask, read, observe, interpret, apply, repeat. Ask, right? Read, observe, interpret, apply, repeat. And even when you don't feel like it, be consistent with it. Keep doing it. Now, again, I'm not a legalist. So that doesn't mean like every day at 6 a.m. you better spend 45 minutes in God's Word. Start somewhere and the word that I use over and over and over again, if you've ever heard me teach on this subject, I use the word consistent. Be consistent with it. Be consistent with it. That means some days when you get up and you forget or you don't have time or whatever and you forget, you don't beat yourself up with it because we're grace people. You don't think, well, God doesn't love me much today. I didn't read it before I started the day. No, pick it up the next day. Be consistent with it. Just get the Bible in you consistently over time. All right, this has been way too much. American author Annie Dillard told the story. British explorers were in search for the North Pole in the 1800s. They knew it would be a two or three month journey based on their calculation. But each sailing vessel in the Queen's Navy carried only 12, a 12-day 12 supply of coal. Two or three month journey, they took only 12 day supply of coal. Here's what they did take. 1,200 volume library for the sailors to read. A hand organ that would play over 50 tunes. China place settings for the officers. Cut glass wine goblets. Sterling silver flatware for the crew to eat on. They took no special Arctic clothing at all, only the uniforms of the Queen's Navy. And when the Eskimos discovered their frozen corpses months later, these men were dressed up in their full gear, pulling a lifeboat that was filled with sterling silver and chocolate. 
because they took 12 days of coal. And we read that story and we think, fools, who would do that? And here's what I don't want you to miss. As a church, as a gathering of Jesus followers, we must be careful not to fall into the trap of focusing our attention on the superficial of focusing our attention on lights or pizzazz or show or performance or coolness. We must not get distracted and focus our attention on things that in the end do not matter. We must not get distracted and forget the coal. I'm not saying that all those things don't find a place and different churches do it different ways and that's fine. There's all those things to be used to worship Jesus. But what I'm saying to you is we cannot allow our attention to be focused on the superficial. That week in and week out, we are going to preach the word. We are going to focus on Jesus crucified and we're going to allow God to do his supernatural work inside of us. We're not going to forget the cold. Because that's where life happens. And that's where life is transformed. Churchy words about the Bible. God's breath on a page. Get it in you. 